Hey, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse, and you're watching Now You Know. On this episode, we're going to be driving up to Keene State College. Um, our friend Steven is an architect there. He just put it in a new residence hall, so we're going to go check it out. This is the, the ceremonial ribbon cutting of the new building. Um, it just went online and students are actually living in it. They had to finish it up while the students were kind of moving in. Um, so it was kind of exciting. We're gonna be asking them all sorts of questions about all the technology that's gone into this new building and uh, giving you an inside peek into what it looks like. Also, what are we doing with the drone today? Um, well, we can't fly it over the college. The president said that we couldn't. The president. of the college, oh. but they didn't say anything about flying it over the town. So. Aha! Loophole! So we're driving up to Keene State College and beautiful fall day. The foliage is just really gorgeous this time of year. Those of our fans who aren't from New England, you pretty much miss out every year. Uh, so what just happened then? So we're driving along a backcountry road going about 35 miles an hour in auto steer. I was trying to get my phone into its phone cradle so I took my eye off the road for a second and just at that moment, auto steer warned me with a visual to put my hand on the wheel like it is now. And I didn't see that, so I ignored it. And then it didn't give me any audible beep, like it's not giving me an audible beep now. And then it knocked me out of auto steer and it wouldn't let me go back into auto steer. So now there's my first beep. That's your, so that was the warning beep that we were looking for, but we didn't get. We didn't get that. And so should I ignore it now and see what happens or should I just? Okay, so we didn't get that before. It went straight to the third final warning and knocked me out. And I don't. And my theory was that we're on a back road and maybe there's a lower threshold for auto steer. Yeah, but maybe I, it was a little bit of a glitch or something. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it just sensed that the road was a little bit more dangerous, like it couldn't see the road or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, we'll have to keep our eye on that for you and, and let you know what we find out. Welcome to New Hampshire. So we're going 50 miles an hour, and I've got it set to 50 miles an hour max speed. If I try and go up with my um, stock to go to a faster speed, I just went up to 55, I'm gonna try and go up to 60. It won't let me. Now, in the old 7.1 version, 7.2, you could go up to 60, 65, 70, and it would let you do that, except the car would stay going 55. Now, it maxes you out at whatever the five mile an hour speed over the speed limit is. Now, when the speed limit changes, let's say it goes up, I'm still in 55, and so I'm going to have to manually go up, which I think is a safer way to do it. What do you think, Jess? Yeah. Jess says, yeah. All right, so what are we doing? All right, so we're gonna put the uh, 360 camera on the roof. Nice. And we're gonna drive through Keene. Awesome. So, and what are we attaching it to the roof with? Uh, so we're using this Joby suction cup mount. It works the best, is what we found. Cool. So we're here in picturesque Keene, New Hampshire on a beautiful fall day. Um, if you look up ahead, in, this is the main street of town and so there's beautiful picturesque restaurants and businesses and the trees are just perfect at this time of year. A little chilly. It might be a little too windy right now for the drone. We wanted to throw the drone up right now and give you a drone shot of the town but we'll probably have to do that after the ceremony. So that'll actually look nicer I think with the, uh, with the sunset. So we're here at Keene State College and we're driving up to the building that our friend Steven designed. Here it is, this is the new residence hall with a gorgeous looking entryway. I can't wait to uh, check it out for you guys inside. That is beautiful. That's one of the most beautiful residence halls I've ever seen. Yeah. That's just gorgeous. I love the brick. Yeah, and it, it fits in with the rest of the campus. Yeah. 
and yet it has its own unique character. Yeah. I love how there's granite along the bottom and we're in the granite state. So we're here with my buddy Steven, who is the one of the lead architects on this beautiful new student residences here at King State College. So this is the lobby. This space is called the hub. And the hub, the mission of the hub was to be interactive so that all the students could meld together. And you'll see once we come up through the space that there are three wings and each of the wings has 30 students and the 30 students times four floors. So there's 120 students on each wing that all mix together in the hub. And the idea behind the hub was to let light in in all directions and really make it an open space so that students could come together and interact. The original idea was that you could gather a hundred or even more students in the space and that you could basically fill the space and have uh, events. And so the idea behind it is you could get a hundred students or even more. You could do a whole wing, a whole floor, or potentially the whole building in one area. It's a living, learning community, so it's a combination of residential and academic life and they mix together and the idea was that this building would be the place where they could mix together. So that one of the things you'll notice and I'll show you when we get a little higher up is that from any residential wing of the building you can see light, natural light in at least two directions if not more. So no matter where you're standing you'll always be able to see light. So in this case you can see light to the north and you can also see right through the stairs and see light to the east and of course light above you as well. So this is uh, the granite state, and these are local granite treads for the stairs. So every floor, two through five, has over 100 students, and they have, we call it the kitchenette. So the kitchenette is a place where there's a microwave, a sink, a bottle filler, and that just allows you to get a bottle of water. All the students have refillable water bottles now. On the downstairs, in the, in the main ground floor area, there's a full kitchen. So when you want to do your Thanksgiving dinner, or you want to have your friends over, there's all the kitchen amenities, stove, fridge, things like that. One of the really great challenges of this project is you're not allowed to have more than three floors worth of open area connected because of um, fire and smoke. And so we had to do these challenging areas where you'd have glass to, to separate. So we're actually standing by glass that separates the ground floor from the second floor. Oh. But yet that area is all one space. And then when you come here and you're on the second floor, two, three, and four are connected. And you'll see as you move through. So the idea is that all the, all the wings are connected through the central hub. And any place that you're standing, when you look, if you look directly west, you see natural light. If you look southwest, you see natural light. If you look north, you see natural light. And if you look east. In fact, if you're standing in the hub stair where we are now, you should be able to see light from everywhere. everywhere. One of the challenges of a residence hall is you need to put as many rooms as you can in one place. And the, the challenge to put all the rooms is you do a double loaded corridor. And a double loaded corridor means that there's bedrooms on both sides. And typically that sort of feels very narrow and you don't take advantage of it because you try to make the, the corridors as narrow as you can to, to be efficient. So what we did is we did bump outs for, to make a little more space for singles. And then little visual cues like the floor tile turning up into the wall tile to sort of break up the space. And even the way the light fixtures run down, they run down, and then at some point they flip to the other side and run down. And that makes it not feel so long and thin. We also did slightly wider corridors than you would typically do, which that six inches of space really makes the, the area feel bigger. And then again, when you get to the end, you're seeing natural light, you're seeing the buildings, the trees, not the glass. So at the end of each wing, there's a study hall. And the study hall is glass enclosed, again, for acoustics. It has writable and tack surfaces. So each of the residential wings needs to be separated in case of a fire. And so what you have is a glass door and a glass side light on a hold open. So if there's an emergency, the magnet flips a switch electrically and the door closes to separate out this main atrium space from the corridor itself. So the sprinkler heads are a special sprinkler and they're a wash system and the way that it works is they need to spray the glass. The sprinklers are actually turning this glass wall into a, into a rated partition. It's a very special type of sprinkler head and fixture that has a very specific purpose. So you'll see them here. And in fact, the regular sprinkler head is concealed. It's called a concealed sprinkler. It's up underneath this cap. Oh, and it pops down? So it pops down. So if whatever the trigger mechanism is for that sprinkler head, the cap would pop off and water would come out. All the study areas and the, the hub common space, the idea was to mix each of the wings so that you could feel connected or disconnected from 
the main area, and also to leverage the idea of double and even triple height spaces. So in this case, you're standing on the second floor. You can look up and see the third floor, and then you can actually even look up and see into the fourth floor. The way the wings are set up, it's a living learning community, so each wing of 30 students is a focused subject, so the biology wing or the math wing or the substance-free wing, and so they take over that whole wing, 30 students, they have their own dedicated study hall at the end of the wing, but then you want to connect those people together so they're not completely isolated and use the hub as a way to do that. But then if you have a space like this, it gets really loud with all the students, especially at night. We use this special acoustic perforated wall, which Wait, is... what is this? So this is, it's a, it's a wood veneer, it's, it's real wood veneer wall, and it has perforations in it, and it has a special felt on the back. And so what it does is it collects sounds and deadens them into the wall. So if you were to yell in this space, as my daughter is currently doing, you can hear her, but it doesn't have that vibrant echo sound. If this were glass or even sheetrock, the sounds would bounce much more. So it was really important to do it in the ceilings and also to do it on the walls in some of the double height spaces because it really does control the sound. And of course, it's also visually appealing. It's very attractive. You can actually hear, I don't, I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hear it. I can really hear it. It's, 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 it's collecting it's collecting the sound wow, and wow. and trapping it. It's it's a I sound attenuation. Recording studio. This know, is yeah. great stuff. It's it's just like you would use in the recording studio and you can actually hear when you're here, you can you can feel the 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 amount of sound that's not coming away and as you step back, it has a little bit of bounce wow. to it. Yeah. The tile turned out really good. We did a terrazzo base. The, so basically what you get is you get your water. This is this one blocks the water and this one is for privacy and the hooks are there so you you that's step nice. in close it, hang your clothes, and then the second one stops the water. Linear floor drains, which is also meant to kind of deal with the inevitable challenge of water. That's cool. So this is a big challenge, actually, the idea of what you do for writing on the walls. And what we ended up deciding to do was writable glass surfaces. So you can basically just erase and write over the surfaces. So in between each room, there's one pane of writable glass. So if you look at the, the two doubles side by side, and then one pane of glass. So they actually share that writable surface. But then for each room itself, it has a writable surface you know, next to your room number. And then of course, each student decorates or chooses to decorate their door. The doors have a special locking system, which is new on campus. It's a proximity card. So all students carry around cards now on campus, and the card's what lets you get into the building. And what it does is it collects that information and stores it. So if there's ever a problem or something goes wrong, they know who's in the room. So it used to be that you, people would prop the doors open. Uh, now if you prop the door open, it sends a signal to campus safety and they say there's a door that's been open for six hours and they could choose to check on it or not. That's the way that they can keep track of what's happening in the buildings and also if they need to go back in time and find out what happened, who's been clicking in and out. The other really added benefit of it that's sort of a new idea, often, especially with first year students, they have problems with, you know, the two students don't get along, so one of them has to move out or there's some sort of fight or problem. They used to, in the middle of the night on a Saturday night, there was a fight and the students have to separate and one of them's leaving the room. They would have to call a locksmith in the middle of the night to come change the locks because the student who stays in the room would have the, the lock and the student wouldn't be able to get in. Now they just switch the code. They just press a button on a computer, get a new code, and that's what keeps the students separated. So all the lights in the building are LED, which run at least 10,000 hours before you need to replace them. So hopefully you won't need to replace them anytime soon. And they're also all, because they're LED, they're all dimmable. Or they're able to be dimmed. This room, you can just see the difference. This is with it one quarter with the lights one quarter on, and this is with the lights off, and with the sunlight that you're getting, you, you hardly need the lights. What LLC are we in? Um, honors. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. The smart people? We do our best. <laughs> I absolutely love living here. That's why I volunteered for the tour. There's a two-step heating system, and basically geothermal takes the temperature up from to about 55 degrees, and then it's taken to the next step with a system that's in the mechanical room on the ground floor and that takes it up to 180. So basically, you preheat using the earth. As you're designing this building, this is for college students. Is there any special things you have to be thinking about because they're college students? There's actually, there's quite a few things. One is the controllability of the systems. You have to find the balance between giving complete control of the systems to 
having the systems be locked down. And the example is uh, heating and cooling. So in your, in your bedroom, you have complete control of heating and cooling, which is great, but often students would turn up the heat or air conditioning and then leave or leave the window open. So we added a system that when the window's open, the heating or cooling shuts off. So that's a good way to save energy and make it easier for students who are always running out the door to class or wherever. Do you have to think about any, uh, any items that students shouldn't be having in their rooms? So there's actually, there's quite a, f quite a few challenging aspects. One is that we needed to put access panels in the ceilings of every single bedroom, and that's to access the electrical for the lighting. But now you have a place where people could hide things that can't be found. So those each have a lock on them. So every bedroom has an access panel with a keyed lock. <laughs> All right, so I don't know if you can see this here, but we've just told Tesla to navigate to home from where we are, and boop, that just pops up, telling us that we'll have 38% when we get home, and the round trip estimate back to where we are here in Keene, New Hampshire would leave us with 14%. That is new to 8.0, and that's a great feature because that tells you how much juice you'll have on your round trip. So we just pulled off of Main Street, and we're looking for a charging station. Not that we really need a charging station, but we just thought we'd show you guys that there are charging stations everywhere you go. And so here are a couple spots that we can take. So let's see if we have what we need to make these work. This looks like a Charge Pro, and uh, I've got a Charge Point. Let's see if it works. So, Jesse's got my Charge Point there. Does it read it? No. Well, let's just try and uh, see what happens. Uh, it's not charging. So this is a good lesson. Um, if you're gonna charge at something other than, say, Charge Point, and you have a Charge Point card, make sure that you get whatever cards you're gonna need. So in this case, I've never heard of Charge Pro, so we're gonna have to look into that for you. It's a SEMA Connect card, so we're gonna look into that. So we've since figured out that we could have charged. If you find yourself at a SEMA Connect station and you don't have an account yet, simply go to the SEMA Connect website on your smartphone, sign up for an account with a credit card, put $10 in the account to get it started, and you'll be able to charge right away. The whole process takes less than two minutes. All right, so we're in Keene, New Hampshire. It is super windy outside. We've been waiting for the wind to die down, but it won't. And Jesse's phone is at 6% battery, so I don't know if he's gonna be able to make this shot, but we're gonna do it anyway, because we're right. crazy like that. We'll try it. Let's, Let's see if it do falls it. out of the sky. All right. <laughs> So let's see if Jesse's phone has enough battery left. Now that he's got it in the air, I guess he's gonna go back to the car where we've got it plugged in. Oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful shot? Yeah. All right, so I like to hear. Keene State. Um, we had a great time talking with Steven. He gave us a great tour of his great building. Um, yeah, it's amazing how much technology goes into a building that you don't know about unless you get to talk to the architect. Yeah. So thank you, Steven, for showing us thank all that. Thank you so much. And what I really liked was um, they're changing how education works at universities, and, and it, I hear that this is kind of the new the new thing that, mm -hmm. that universities are doing. So instead of just building dorms, which comes from the old French uh, word of dormitory, dormitory right. to sleep, um, they're, they're making this into a learning, living residence. So 11 faculty live in the building with you. I gotta believe that if I'm a student at a university like that and there's faculty living there with me, yeah. I'm gonna be a better student. I'm gonna be a better citizen. Yeah, you know? you're right. And the fact that there's three classrooms in my residence hall. Right, and that's where you go to class. I think that that's really cool. Yeah, so that means that my home is my learning. Like, that's the way it should be. Right. You know? Yeah, so I mean, you wake up and, and all the people who are in your classes are on the same floor as you, like right next to you, they're your neighbors. So I mean, that's cool. So that's you just really like, cool. you know, walk over next door and say, hey, you wanna work on the homework? You know what I liked? They didn't save this for the upperclassmen. This is where the freshmen go. That's really cool. You know, and so, Imagine you walk in as a freshman and you're getting this experience. I mean, I'm just, I'm really blown away by that whole Absolutely. experience. 
And there's so much technology that's in that building. I love how you can set the temperature, that there's air conditioning and heating in there. I mean, every single student was like, I love the air conditioning. And yeah, I because totally understand. I've been in so many dorm rooms where it's basically just a prison. They have, you know, a heat vent that's just blowing hot air in all winter, summer long. It's just like, then you have to keep the window open because otherwise you'll boil to death. It's so smart because we were talking about this earlier. Instead of looking at it as, well, that would be too expensive to give each of these units their own air conditioning. Right. It's going to save money over time because they're not going to have to blast heat in the entire building all winter all long. All the time. And and so when they open the window, it shuts off their, um, their, their AC, or, AC heat. or heat. Yeah. That's so smart. That's so, I mean, because, I mean, if you're opening the window, you're going to be throwing away energy anyway. I mean, I've been in so many dorm rooms from like different ages and here's the history, like you can totally tell depending on the age of the of the dorm or, or the residence hall in this case, like how much thought got put into it. Like, and I've, so I've been in some that are just like cinder block rooms with a window and a heater and you know, they throw beds in there and it just is terrible. It really feels like a prison. Yeah. Um, and and then I've been in the newer dorms and stuff like that are usually a little bit nicer um, But this definitely takes the cake in terms of what I've seen so far And today was basically the two-year anniversary of when they broke ground So I mean they broke ground in September of 2014 and went from having to completely demolish and start a building from scratch yeah. to being it the students moved in in August wow. at the end of August so that they had this real time crunch to, to meet by and they did it and that's yeah. That's amazing, because to finish a building where students are going to move in the, the day you finish, yeah, uh, unbelievable. Everything has to be right, yeah. And it's just such a gorgeous building, I mean, that they thought about natural light so much, and that no, pretty much no matter which way you turned, you were looking out a window. Yeah. Um, the sight lines and everything about it were so great, and the, and the whole atmosphere of the whole place, it just feels, I don't know. Every room, every corridor we went into, you felt like you were part of the outside environment. You didn't get, you didn't, most dorms you walk into and There's it's like, stuff. it's like being a casino. You're like, oh, time has stopped and now right. it could be dark out or light out. Right. Here you felt like you understood that you were still part of the campus. Yeah. It was it, really nice. And I mean, yeah, it was gorgeous. So, big shout out to Steven. What an amazing building you put together. Um, all by yourself. No one else helped you. <laughs> <laughs> so... Thank you so much for letting us interview you and and uh, you know talk to you about your building. Thanks for watching Now You Know. We had a great time filming it and we hope that you have a great time watching it. And uh, I hope that you learned something new. I certainly did. So uh, if you liked it, please feel free to subscribe and to like it and uh, leave a comment down below if there's any questions or comments that you have. Also, we drove here in a Tesla Model X and we drove this car all the way across the country. Um, and if you haven't seen that yet, like if you're a new viewer to our channel, definitely check that out. Click the, uh, the Now You Know logo down below Below, it'll bring you to our channel and from there you can probably find our road trip. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.